Good morning, family. Hey, it's so great to see everybody here this morning. I appreciate you all coming out. For those of you joining us online, we appreciate you joining us. We hope to see you guys soon. Uh, I'm, my name's Dave Russell. I'm an elder here at the University Church of Christ. I just wanted to welcome you. Uh, thank you for coming out. We appreciate you. Uh, we love you, and we hope that we can get to see and do this uh, some more. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll just go ahead and open us with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We praise your name. We thank you, God, for blessing us so richly. Thank you, God, for blessing us with your Son who died on the cross, Lord, to save us from our sins. My God, I pray that you would be in this world, be in this time, be in this place. I pray that you would fill our hearts with strength, that you would give us boldness, God, to go forth and to speak your word and to do your will and look for places in life where we can insert ourselves and help others, God. Help us to love others and to see others like you see them, God, because you created all of us. Heavenly Father, help us to remember that. My God, again, thank you for your son. Thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us. It's in your name, Father, that we pray. Amen. Have to touch it. I don't know. Can't help it. <laughs> so, um, welcome again. And we want to give a special welcome to all of our kids that are here with us and all of the kids that are watching with their families online. We're glad that you're here. And I wanted to tell you it's a new month and a new story. So, if you um, go to our Facebook page when we're done here, um, you will find our new story and our new memory verse. And our story is about a woman who gives everything she has to God. Um, it's the story of the widow's offering. You're going you're gonna to really like it. It's short, but you're going to love it. And this is our memory verse this, this month. And we're going to say it together as we learn it. Uh-oh, it's sort of squished. Here we go. It goes like this. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. Look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So if you go onto our Facebook page, you can find the song and the motions that go with it that will help you to remember this really great verse. Um, and... This is um, a, a good verse for the time that we live in right now where things are kind of crazy and your world is nutty. You're at home all the time. You, don't, you may not even understand everything that's happening, but God sees you. He sees your heart. So we're going to say it one more time. Are you ready? We're going to say it one more time. Here we go. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Okay, um, I am going to read you a scripture that Matt is going to use in his lesson. And I'm going to do it on my phone, but that means I'm old and I have to take my glasses off. Okay, this is from Acts 2, verse 17 and 18, and this is Peter talking. Sorry, lost my place. Um, 
He said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Our verse is telling us that we are all part of God's kingdom, and God's spirit is for all of us. Whether you're young, whether you're a kid here in the audience at home, or whether you're old, or whether you're somewhere in between, God's spirit is working in you. No matter what you look like, no matter what skin color you have, no matter if you're a, a girl or a boy, God is using you. Because what did our memory verse say? That God looks at the heart. He doesn't see our outward appearance. He's using all of us. So when Matt gets up to talk, I want you kids to really be listening for this verse about how everyone is part of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is for all of us. So you be watching for it. I want you to take note, and then you can talk about it with your moms and dads, what our memory verse has to do with this scripture that Matt's going to talk about. Good morning. Welcome. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Amy. Um, don't worry. I'll put this back on. Uh, for our, do a worship psalm. It's so weird we're not singing together, but that's okay. We get to sing. We can sing all the time. We get to, like, our lives are just these lives of being, of worshipful lives, but, like, this is one that would have been sung, and so Psalm 19, listen to what it says. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the, end of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its seat. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors, forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer. O oh Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer. Nick's going to come up here and lead us into our time of communion now, where we get to gather around, and take, and eat and drink. This is one of the most exciting reasons for, for me to get together as a, a family, as brothers and sisters, is to, is to take this time of communion. When, when, Jesus, when Jesus is at the Last Supper, he says, do this in remembrance of me. We take, we take this little piece of bread at the top of your cup and, and, and the grape juice at, at the bottom. We, we take that, and, and, and the bread means we're, we're, we're jumping on board with what the cross did to his body. And before you guys take it, before you guys take it, I want to take a moment and reflect 
about what his body actually did on the cross. It's broken for our sins. We're consuming the grape juice, which represents his blood, the blood shed on the cross. And, and there's a reason that one of the most repeated commands in the New Testament is remember. Remember what Jesus has done for you because it's so easily, it's so easy to get distracted of the things going on in this, in this life, get, get, get consumed in, in the issues and the worries and the ways of this world that it's hard to remember that the true way to reconciliation is through the cross. The true way of peace, the true way of love is only achieved by what Christ has done on the cross. So, so whenever we take this moment and we take communion together, let's remember that despite everything going on in the world right now, that Jesus has won and we have victory on the cross. Now this is fun right now. We, this is the time where we're able to eat and drink together. So what I want everyone to do is stand up and, 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 and this time we get to take off our mask. We get to get to see everybody around, around each other. We get to see each other's face. We get to see each other smiling and make eye contact and, and just be together as a family. So before we take communion and, and pray together, just look around. Look at your brothers and sisters in Christ that you haven't seen in person in months. Man, this is awesome. This is awesome to see everybody's face. <laughs> now, now this moment, like I said, just remember, take time to pray, and let's spend some time contemplating the things of Christ. Okay, one more last look around. Wave at everybody. Smile at everybody. Let them see your smiling faces. Let them see. It's so great. Just a little longer, a little longer. Okay. And now, you can be seated, and we're going to watch a video. Kids, tune in. I think you'll like this, too. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply. That too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. 
While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's spirit. And so today, the spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Um, people that are joining us online, welcome. This is all weird. It's all strange. Uh, but I can't tell you like how excited I was to wake up early this morning and actually drive to church and preach to real people. That was, uh, that was great. Even though some of you were very gracious in your comments uh, to me, um, like I heard things like, Matt, you're doing great online. Actually, I think you're a better online preacher than in person. Um, so thank you for that. I, I know that that was meant to be super encouraging, but <laughs> that's, it's, it's so good to, um, to be back here. Um, and I just, I, I really, I just want us to start uh, like we normally start. It, it'll, I know it'll kind of be muffled under your breath, but let's start with a declaration before God and before each other of who we are and what we believe in. So, will please repeat after me. The Lord is our God. Oh, it still sounds so great. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Really important these days. Um, through all of this, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Um, I know these, these last um, two, three months have been trying um, for all of us in various ways and different ways. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I got so used to preaching behind the table that I thought, well, I'll just keep preaching behind the table. Um, and one of the things that I love about the table is, is, like, you can welcome people. You can welcome people to the table in ways that, that are a little difficult to welcome somebody when I'm, you know, standing behind something or I've got a music stand in front of me. But, but you can welcome people to the table and in days like today and in weeks and, and months and years like the past few years, weeks and months um, that we've been in, we, we, need, we need tables and we need people and we need families welcoming people and families to the table. And it's what Nick pointed out earlier, part of the power and the beauty of, of communion, of sharing the supper together, is that we get, to, we get to invite people to the table and share a meal with each other. And, and in the meal, the Lord actually meets us. And, and in His presence is reconciliation and 
And we desperately need reconciliation these days. Listen to this quote um, from a preacher recently. He said, racism is evil. It is demonic to its core to treat people with dishonor because of their skin color is absolute foolishness. To turn that dishonor into violence is barbaric and inhuman. In Christ, we have the privilege and responsibility to oppose racism in all its forms and to stand with those who have suffered under its weight. There's a prophecy about the Spirit of God and the work of the Holy Spirit found in the book of Joel. and We heard it just a few minutes ago when Amy read it. I actually read it last week when we looked at God's presence, the fire of the Lord, His house, and Pentecost. And this prophecy was part of the Apostle Peter's first sermon that he preached in Acts chapter 2. And after the Holy Spirit descended and, and people saw the fire of the Lord like, like tongues resting on people, they saw His presence and, and His Spirit filled houses made of flesh and bone instead of houses made of brick and mortar. And this morning with everything that's happened over the last couple of weeks, I think we really need to hear these words again. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. The Spirit has already descended in the form of fire. looks like tongues. People are amazed. They're, they're perplexed. They're bewildered. They mock the disciples. And then Peter gets up. They, they, they make fun of them. They say they've had too much to drink. Peter gets up, and this is what he says. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Follow fellow Jews and, and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, all flesh, all people. I'm going to pour out my spirit, not just on a select few, on all people, all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. This is what it's going to look like. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I'll show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is this is the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and, and what, it, what the Holy Spirit looks like effectively in the world around him. And I want, I want to take us back to some of the very first things that Jesus said before he started. There it is. We love that. <laughs> before he started his, his public ministry, all the way back in Luke, in Luke chapter 4, listen to what Jesus said. Listen to the connection of the Spirit. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Starting in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me. Why? To preach good news to the poor. To, pro to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, release the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So then Jesus calls these guys, his disciples, to walk with him. And, and then at the end of this, those are some of the first words that he said. Then, then at the end, after he's resurrected, here's some of the last words that Jesus said. Talking about the Spirit of God again. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. And on one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with him, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You will extend my kingdom. You will extend my rule, my reign. You will keep my mission going. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I can imagine when he's saying this to the apostles, to the disciples, to those people that were there, some of it would have been like, well, well Jesus, you had me. I was with you until you said Samaria. I, I'm good with, with Jerusalem and Judea. But Samaria, those people aren't like us. All the ends of the earth, those people really aren't like us. And Jesus says, wait. You will need power from on high. You will need otherworldly power. You need the power of my presence, the Holy Spirit, in order to continue my mission. The one that I started that said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. Preach good news to the poor. Recovery of sight for the blind. Release the oppressed. Freedom for the prisoner. You'll need power. So wait. Wait. Because my mission has to extend beyond just Jerusalem, beyond just Judea, the people that are like us. It has to extend to the world. To Samaria, yeah, even Samaria. All the ends of the earth. And then we read again what happened in Acts chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men dream dreams. All my servants, both men and women, pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, I hope what you've seen as we've walked through him beginning his ministry and him leaving those last words that he left with the disciples, with the apostles, with the people that were there, with the Holy Spirit. And then what we see in Acts chapter, that, that Jesus through the Holy Spirit was leveling the playing field for everyone. Leveling the playing field for everybody. All flesh. All flesh. All people. Leveling the playing field for every race, for every ethnicity. For your sons and your daughters, leveling the playing field for men and for women, for your young men, old men, leveling the playing field for the young and for the old. For servants, leveling the playing field for every class, every socioeconomic class, upper, middle, lower. And this was the birth of the church. This was the birth of the church. This was God, like we talked about last week, this was God changing his address, creating houses of worship in and through us. It's God's presence, his spirit filling humans in a way that we actually get to carry his presence with us everywhere. And the fruit of the spirit of Jesus-filled followers, we read this at the end of Acts chapter 2, is that they were that all the believers were together and had everything in common. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who had need. And it really sounds like that the Spirit of God and what we see in the fruit of that is the playing field is just leveled. And it sounds like Jesus' mission was being fulfilled Preach the good news to the poor. Freedom for the prisoner. Recover his sight for the blind. Release the oppressed. And, and this, is, this is fascinating to me. Because from the very beginning of time, God has chosen to partner with humanity. I'm not exactly sure why, but he has. Chosen to partner with humanity to advance his kingdom, his rule, and his ways. All the way back to the beginning. In Genesis, in the garden, he tells Adam and Eve... Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Now granted, God has just created Adam and Eve out of nothing. So he could do all of these things himself. He could multiply them. He could fill the earth. He could subdue it, subdue it himself. But instead he chose to part with it, and he told them, fill the earth, multiply, and subdue it. And later he invites Adam into the process of even naming creation. Brings the animals before them. 
God could have named all of them himself, but instead he chose, Adam, come here, whatever you call them, that's what these animals are going to be. We see God continually invite humanity into the process of partnering with him to advance his kingdom, his rule, and his reign. And then Jesus arrives on the scene, and he's doing the same thing. Jesus rounds up his disciples, invites them into the process of carrying out his mission, the work of the Lord. We just read about it in Acts 1, where he tells them to wait. And now we receive, see the results in Acts 2. Spirit-filled followers of Jesus, partnering with, co-laboring with the Lord to see his kingdom, his mission advanced. And that extends to all of us today. Every one of us that would call on the name of the Lord, pledge our allegiance, our lives to following Jesus wherever he may lead, as spirit-filled carriers of the presence of God, we join his mission, we advance the kingdom, and we are supposed to see the playing field leveled all around us. And yet, we wake up to a world on fire. We've all seen, heard, read about the horrific events from May 25th and the senseless killing of George Floyd. Much of our nation was glued to a screen as we watched a black man's life ebb away almost in real time. And we're reminded of the harsh reality that the playing field is not level. And it hasn't been for a very long time. It hasn't been level for the poor or the marginalized or the oppressed. It hasn't been level for women. And it certainly hasn't been level for people of color. last few weeks have been talking about refining our focus and getting back to the gospel, the reward, the good news, the glad tidings, where the end game is the presence of God. It's, it's just Him and getting to be with Him and getting back to repentance, ironically. Maybe this is a divine appointment, but back to repentance and back to spirit-filled houses of worship. And now today, we refine our focus again and, and get back to just simple humanity and the sacredness and the value of human life. Those first spirit-filled believers, they were all together and had everything in common. And the fruit of the Spirit being poured out on all flesh, on all people, on all flesh, was that the playing field leveled. And the tragedy is that we have categorized and subcategorized all flesh into different shades of white, black, and brown. And based on categories that, that we've come up with, that we've created, we've determined who's privileged and who's disadvantaged, who's elite and who's marginalized, who's favored and who's unfavored, and who has built-in opportunity and who doesn't. We've constructed a, a playing field so disproportionately unlevel that it will take a spirit-filled move of God to bring us back to a level playing field. Thank goodness for the gospel. Thank goodness for the gift of God and His presence. Thank goodness for Jesus' followers, even though we haven't always gotten that part right. And thank goodness for repentance. Because the Lord knows we need it. And I wonder, a week out of, away from Pentecost Sunday, I wonder if we have another chance. I wonder if there's a chance for another Pentecost. Pentecost. 
I wonder if we get to see that in our lifetimes and not just dream of it for our kids and for our grandkids. I wonder if there's another chance for another Pentecost. <laughs> Usually, when I pray for like a Pentecost-type revival, I read Acts 2, and I, I want to see the things that they saw. I want to see the signs and wonders and miracles and healing and transformation. I love when the Lord moves in those ways. But now... Pentecost type revival. What if we just need to see a mighty move of God that gets us back to being together, to having everything in common, and recognizing the Spirit of God poured out on all flesh? I mean, you remember what marked Pentecost? Things that mark Pentecost, the Spirit of the Lord and, and fire and His presence. The gospel heard in all languages. People were amazed and, and bewildered and perplexed, and they made fun of them. They mocked them. And we can expect all with a great move of God, but then part of it was deep repentance. It says they, they were cut to the heart. Deep repentance. And it has to start with us, has to start with the church. We have to repent for years of being complicit in establishing and furthering systems of injustice. And if we're really going to be spirit-filled houses of worship that carry the very presence of God, what was said about those first believers must be said about us. Where do we go from here? It has to start with repentance. And remember how we talked about repentance? It has to start with repentance. We're repentance, changing the way that we think, changing the way that we reason, changing the way that we use our minds. We have to be so familiar with the life of Jesus that our thinking actually matches his thinking. This is repentance. Some of us, it may take a complete U-turn. Some of us just altering our course just a little bit. But for all of us, it's changing the way that we think. So the way that we think is more in line with the way that he thinks. Cut to the heart. It's deep repentance. Next, I, where do we go from here? I, I read this quote by a preacher in New York. He said, talking about raising his kids to think like Jesus. And he said, I tell my kids, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm not going to tell you what, what to think, but I'm going to teach you how to think. I'm not going to tell you what to think, but I'm going to teach you how to think. Raising his kids to think like Jesus and lots of people threatening to take your basic fundamental right, your responsibility, to think for yourself. And essentially, it seems like that's what social media has become. What it's all about these days is we're going to tell you how to think. I'm going to tell you how to think, or you're going to tell me how to think. And but we can't let people tell us what to think. We have to instead learn how to think and learn to think like Jesus. Not this, this ambiguous, let me learn how to think, but really learn to think like Jesus. And where do we go from here? Now, I love stories. I think in moments like this, 
We have to have tables. And we have to have stories. And so invite people to your table. Invite people into your home that didn't grow up like you. And those of us that are white, hear a person of color's story. Add a name and a face and a narrative to someone's life. Otherwise, you're just left with a bunch of nameless, faceless, storyless data that you can treat however you want. And it's going to take courage. We have to have the courage to humble ourselves, to repent, to change the way that we think so that maybe we can be part of another Pentecost, another great move of God. During dark and evil and demonic times, it's time for the church to be the light of the world in a city on a hill. Remember the quote, racism is evil. It's demonic to its core. To treat people with dishonor because of their skin color is absolute foolishness. To turn that dishonor into violence is barbaric and inhuman. In Christ, we have the privilege and responsibility to oppose racism in all its forms and to stand with those who have suffered under its weight. We need spirit-filled houses of worship dispersed all across this city, all across our state, all across our nation, all across the world. We need the Lord to fall like fire again and to do something so otherworldly that people are amazed and bewildered and perplexed and maybe even mock us. Because the world has to see the fruit of Almighty God partnering with His people, with us, with all flesh, to advance His kingdom, His rule, His reign, and His justice. So that in our lives, what would be said about us, what would be said about the church, what would be said about the bride of Christ, what would, what would be said about spirit-filled houses of worship, spirit-filled Jesus followers, that they were all together, they had everything in common. And they leveled the playing field. And let it be seen in the church first. I'm going to take a minute and we're going to pray and then we'll be done. We have such a chance right now to show the world what he's really like to show the world what a level playing field really looks like because the spirit has been poured out on all flesh and I don't want to waste this chance Love people, love them well, dust off your table, and invite people in. Put a name, and a face, and a story. Somebody's life, instead of just being left with nameless, faceless, storyless data, So, Father, give us the courage in these moments to repent, to change the way that we think. To carry out the mission of Jesus.
taking the reward of the gospel in your presence to the poor. Recovery of sight for the blind. Help us to see. Freedom for the prisoner. Deliver us. A release for the oppressed. So that the way that we live our lives just announces who you are, your favor. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to fall again. Level the playing field again. Let us be those that the story that's written about us is we were all together. We had everything in common. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that I ask and that I bless and we all pray. Amen. Tristan's going to come up here and close us out, but it has been so good to see every one of us. It's so good to be together again. Love you all. Hello. There we go. That's way better. Um, before I close out, before we move into a time of giving, can I just say thank you? I know masks are one of the most uncomfortable things that has ever been on my face. Um, it's weird not being able to hug each other. It's weird not being able to say hi and really interact the way that we're used to. I know that there's people watching online that would give anything to be here in person, but either for health reasons or or for some other reason, they aren't able to be with us. And I know that's hard. I know it's really hard. But still, even though we're meeting under I, uh, not ideal circumstances, we get to gather around good news. The good news that the tomb is empty. Good news of the resurrection. And so that gives us every reason to celebrate, no matter what we're going through in life. And can I just say, if... If you came here with a lot of baggage, if, if quarantine and isolation has been tough on you, you are so loved. You're so loved by our community here at UCC. Even though you don't necessarily know us, we love you, we see you, and you belong here. We're going to move into a time of giving. If you're new with us, please don't feel obligated to give whatsoever. We're just glad that you're here with us. If you did come prepared to give, here's how you can do that. You can give online. You can pull out your phone right now and go to our website, church, the number for the city.com. And there on our website, you can find our giving tab. You can also text to give. If you pull out your phone again, you can text the number 84321 with the amount that you would like to donate. And I know not a lot of people probably know about that. If you haven't texted to give before, what it'll have you do the first time is it'll have you set up your bank account information that'll run through our system at UCC. It's completely and totally secure, and whenever you get that set up, it's a one-time thing, and after that, you can just text the amount that you would like to donate, and it'll run through everything. If you wanted to give manually, either by check or with money, um, being that we're gonna limit exposure and all that stuff, we're not gonna be passing around baskets. Instead, we've strategically placed some baskets offering bins at the exit. Um, you can drop that in if you have a check on your way out. If you are donating with cash, we have cash envelopes. And we ask that if you do have that, you would put your cash in the envelope, write the amount on the outside, and your name. That's all we need. And then that way we can figure out um, who donated what and how much. That would really, really help us out to keep track of everything. Um, I think that's it for the giving. Again, thank you so much for being with us. It's, uh, it's way better to be in person, to see faces, even though it's, it's behind a mask. We love you guys dearly. 
that's it. You are sent out.